looks like we're on the hour uh, and I can see that we're still gathering, but um, thank you everyone for joining in and welcome. Uh, and thank you also, I just wanted to, it's the first time I have the opportunity to thank Feather, my co-chair for the conference, uh, for all the uh, support and work that we've done together, thanks to Feather. Um, and uh, I think, Heather, did you want to say a few words before we kick off? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Corin. I'm sorry about the, the dogs, they've been like quiet. And then of course, right when the meeting launches, they decide to like attack the delivery drivers that's across the street. Um, it's great to be here um, today uh, for this, uh, for the keynote. Um, and, and thanks to, to my co-chair, um, Cora, and the members of the um, Forest Program Committee who are joining us. Um, Iracha, who's doing like wearing at least three hats um, for this today. And I see, um, I see Simon Worthington um, as well. So um, I'm really excited. Uh, I got involved in Force about, um, I think I want to say like 2018, 2019. Um, it's one of my favorite um, events to participate in. So when uh, when Todd reached out to see um, if I would join um, Cora, who had already signed on, I was like, you know, absolutely, let's make it happen. So uh, I don't want to take up any more time, but um, just a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for all of you for your participation and, and support. And um, I can't wait to hear the keynote. Lovely. Uh, and thank you, Heather. So um, just a, a few words of regular housekeeping. Uh, I think, Rashi, if you wanted to progress the slide, uh, obviously, great thanks to our sponsors uh, for supporting our event. And then let's progress once more. Uh, and uh, a few notes of housekeeping is that uh, you obviously probably have already found your way uh, to shared because you're here. Uh, but just a reminder that if you needed any more joining instructions to, for following sessions, you can still continue to pre-use uh, our schedule on shared. Uh, and um, uh, we invite everyone to join conversations about what you hear and whether you have, you know, points that you wanted to discuss, questions for the speakers, uh, or any points of inspiration or budding initiatives. Please uh, join the conversation on the uh, Force Eleven Conference um, Slack channel, uh, and the invitation to that is also on shared if you missed it. Uh, also, we just want to make sure that this event uh, is productive and enjoyable for everyone. Uh, so obviously we would uh, appreciate if you um, uphold the code of conduct and you can find the uh, link to that um, in, on the slide as well right now. Uh, in addition to that, if you experience any technical difficult difficulties, uh, you can contact us via the help desk channel on Force 11 Slack uh, or simply email admin at uh, force11.org uh, and someone will be able to assist you. Thank you very much. Without further ado, uh, I wanted to introduce our keynote speakers. Uh, Irasha, uh, who is also part of our conference committee, and hence I have been asking her to progress some slides for me. Uh, <laughs> she's um, uh, her primary role, though, uh, is uh, to be a director of strategic initiatives uh, and community for ASAP Bio. Uh, she uh, works to foster awareness of preference and uh, drive community engagement with them. Uh, but also coordinates the uh, uh, Asset Bio Fellows program, uh, of which uh, obviously uh, the, uh, her co-speaker has been part uh, in the last year. Uh, prior to Asset Bio, Irasha worked uh, in uh, publishing and held a number of editorial roles, uh, starting with Biomed Central and then also uh, within PLOS. She's also part of the Committee on Publication, Ethic, uh, on publication Ethics and co-leads uh, the Force 11 Research Data Publishing Ethics Working Group. Uh, and uh, her um, partner for, uh, in, in this talk uh, will be uh, uh, Tanika Kana, uh, who is a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where she's investigating um, uh, mechanisms of bacterial uh, pathogenesis, uh, studying the Burkhardia Thailand disease, uh, which has the unique ability to induce cell-to-cell -cell fusion. And I'm sure that you can ask her more questions about that. Uh, but why she is here today is probably more because of her uh, role in the Asset Bio uh, Ambassador Program last year, where she helped to develop a competition to call uh, for the use of preprints to share negative results in the community. So, thank you very much, and ladies, the floor is yours. Right, thank you so much, Cora and Heather, and to everyone involved with Pulse 11 to, for the opportunity to, to talk to you about preprints today at this keynote. Um, there is always a good opportunity to speak preprints, so what better one as part of this conference? Um, right, so for today, Kanika and I thought that we could do a, a joint presentation 
where we would tell you a little bit as to how preprints can be a tool to allow different research communities to start their own uh, their own new paths, start their own paths in science uh, communication. And to start with, uh, we were a little bit, well, quite a bit inspired by the topic of the conference, the, the global and the local, and um, to start the, the presentation, we thought we, we, we would start with a global uh, view. We know that public, the publications, scientific publications are very important in the research process. They are obviously um, what researchers uh, aim to achieve in terms of communicating their work uh, for the community so that others can build on their findings. But we also know that they are uh, particularly important in many settings, at least uh, the way they are set up today, in terms of um, giving credit and recognition and helping researchers advance in their career. So that uh, scientific publications hold a huge influence, but we know that the current output in how science is communicated and disseminated brings with it many disparities. The map that we display here, and you may have seen this before, represents the, the world according to uh, the um, distribution of scientific uh, publications, and this is based on journal publications. So what you can very clearly see from this uh, map is that as things stand now or recently, this is a map from 2016, there is a high representation here from certain regions, such as North America and Western Europe, and underrepresentation of some other regions in the world, uh, particularly South America, uh, Africa, etc. So, so we know that there are some issues in terms of how science is being uh, communicated that, that are driven by certain uh, disparities. And some factors that can feed into this relate to the way in which the traditional system for publication has been running, at least the way it operates at journals uh, traditionally. A few of the factors that fit into this are listed here. The first one is the cost to access knowledge and also to publish research. So in the traditional model of journal publications, many journals operated subscriptions, which meant that only those researchers that could afford to pay the subscription or were lucky enough to be placed uh, based at an institution that could afford the subscriptions, could access that uh, knowledge, that those publications that were coming out in their fields. Luckily, we are now uh, moving to a system where there are more and more publications coming out in, in an open access format, but we also know that even within the model of open access, there are some uh, barriers there to participation because some of the journals uh, will require a publication fee to make uh, uh, those articles openly available. A second uh, uh, factor here that can be a barrier to participating in the traditional journal a publication system is that related to language. English is the lingua franca for research, but obviously there are researchers uh, working all over the world. And for some of them, English is their first language and for many others, it is not. So this can introduce barriers in terms of how they, they report their work or meeting the language requirements for the journals where they may seek to publish. And an important third element that we also wanted to mention here is the fact that the traditional journal publication model often relies on peer review as a mechanism for gatekeeping, for making the decision as to what, essentially whether that piece of research is suitable for a particular journal. Peer review is an important process, an important way for authors to receive feedback and to scrutinize the latest research and its rigor. But this focus on gatekeeping can mean that it can be tricky for some authors and for some communities, again, to participate and publish in a, a certain uh, journals. But luckily things have been changing. So I'm going to hand over to Kanika to tell us how. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, you know, for allowing me to speak. And I think I want to bring more of a perspective from an early career researcher about how we can really uh, take advantage of the resources that are coming up in the digital age now. And you know, as uh, the medium of communication uh, and dissemination of information is evolving, and how can we best take advantage of it? So, you know, Irati, you clearly mentioned like some of the points due to which it, uh, it the traditional uh, public uh, publication mechanism uh, is uh, you know uh, it's sort of challenging. But you know, we live in an era of preprints, 
and uh, all of these counter you know points that were mentioned can be counter uh, counteracted by the use of preprints. So as we know, preprints offer a free form of communication. So we don't have to pay any cost to publish an article in BioArchive uh, or uh, any other uh, relevant preprint server uh, that one may be aware of. And um, the other thing is about communication in different languages. So I think it's right now that English is the lingua franca in science communication, but that was not always the case. Uh, and you know, people had been disseminating information, you know, in local languages like Latin and everything before the uh, uh, onset of colonization period. So now we have the uh, you know uh, resources to actually uh, disseminate our work in local languages like CLO preprints, which offer the authors the uh, chance to you know, like disseminate information in local languages. And the other thing about uh, gatekeeping, uh, peer review as a form of gatekeeping, this can also be counteracted by preprints because preprints allow for a more constructive feedback by engaging the entire community. So instead of one or two reviewers uh, who may be experts, uh, you know, judging your research, it doesn't have to be this way. And uh, we all know that it takes a lot of time to get peer review out of the door. And uh, you know, if you have a preprint, you can avail now many uh, you know free services in which uh, you know the entire community who may have expertise in you know one or two different things about your research, like they can uh, engage uh, in the science communication aspect of it more broadly rather than everything happening behind closed doors. So uh, in the next slide, um, you know, so we kind of structured this presentation to talk about four very unique cases of how preprints have been used. Uh, which are, uh, you know, different than traditional modes of academic sharing and publications. So, you know, like one of the things that we we'll talk about is collaboration. So how, uh, uh, you know, like preprints can give really agency to the authors to, you know, like allow them to figure out what their work means and when and how to share it with the scientific community. And uh, collaboration can really improve the science by sharing results early. And then the uh, researchers can get opportunities to collaborate with people who have complementary expertise. Uh, we'll talk about diversity as well. So preprints are not restricted by language or format or geographic boundaries, uh, and they're free to access. So how can preprints better support those? Um, then sharing negative results. So you know, like science is an iterative process, and when we say new findings are built upon previous findings, uh, those previous findings can be both positive and negative. And we as scientists are, I think, biased to think of advance as only a positive result uh, or something which confirms the hypothesis, which may not be the case. So how preprints can enable sharing of negative results uh, and how uh, preprints can enable sharing of tools and resources. So, you know, preprints can fit the bill for publishing uh, even small resources and tools which may not have a home in traditional academic publishing, but which can be useful for the larger scientific community. So uh, I'll hand over to uh, Irate now, who is going to talk about uh, some of the aspects of collaboration and diversity. Thanks so much, Kanika. So to start, we thought that we could uh, give you an example of a case where preprints have been used to really drive forward um, a research collaboration at a very global level, but with a very huge impact locally. Uh, and example, uh, before we get to that, we wanted to highlight the fact that actually when we ask authors what their motivations are, about uh, sharing preprints and in particular to share preprints early on compared to their, to their journal submission. Um, co a collaboration with others is a particularly interesting uh, aspect of the benefits that they can get. Um, what we saw here are the results from a survey that we ran uh, last year where we were asking authors what feedback they would like to receive or they were hoping to receive when they were putting the research out uh, as a preprint. And as you can see, there were a number of things that they mentioned at the very a lot of flavors as to what the reactions and feedback would be useful to them but the the item that was selected that the, by the majority of the respondents was the opportunities to collaborate with other groups in a similar area which i find quite interesting because it, it turns kind of ups and the, the the competition to get into a particular journal again flipping that into a more collaborative um, an iterative way of doing research. So the example that we wanted to share with you uh, relates to this research effort that was done internationally in response to a wheat blast epidemic that took place in Bangladesh several years ago. So what happened is that uh, several researchers in Bangladesh uh, came to know that there had been 
some outbreaks uh, in, in the crops for wheat uh, in the region. And actually this had impacted up to 16% of the crops for wheat, wheat in Bangladesh uh, with a massive uh, loss of crops. So wheat is not necessarily the main crop in, in Bangladesh, but it's now the second one in terms of production. So this was not trivial in terms of the impact for, for the farmers there and for, for food security. Uh, and the local researchers from Bangladesh, what they did is very quickly, they wanted to start looking into this and decided to take samples from the fields, but also put out a call to the international research community to see if they could uh, get any information or help in terms of addressing this epidemic they were seeing. And this very quickly put them in touch with a number of other researchers based in different settings, different countries from Europe and South America. And what they did is start to work together in response to the, uh, these, these outbreaks uh, in the crops. They got together a research group and started collaborating on this. Um, the international collaborators helped them to uh, complete some genomic and transcri transcriptomic analysis on the samples that they had been collecting. And with this, the, what they did is identify the fact that there was a fungus that it was uh, uh, attacking those crops. And also they managed to uh, trace this back to actually a lineage of that uh, fungus that had originated from South America. So again, we live in this globalized uh, world. It means that pathogens move from uh, one place to another and it doesn't only happen for things uh, like COVID that impact humans. This is also relevant for plant pathogens. So as part of this collaboration within six weeks of starting the research, uh, the authors decided to put out their, their findings quickly together out for the community to start building on that. And they wrote a paper again that, that they served as a preprint on bioarchive within six weeks of starting the research. And at the same time, they, they saw that sequences in a public platform again to make sure that others in the community could make use of this. They also used the preprint as well to get comments from the community and continue building on that. The collaboration did not end here. They went on to publish this paper at the journal in BMC Biology. But the other things that they did following this is also draw the lessons from how they reacted to this epidemic in Bangladesh and develop a paper uh, providing some recommendations as to how to respond to plant, plant pathogens with a particular focus again on the uh, value of adopting open science practices and openly sharing with the community in a rapid way to inform those responses uh, in the local settings. They have continued this collaboration and continued working on, on this uh, fungus that is affecting wheat. And what they've done is they've, uh, they have done further analysis also looking at some other outbreaks that then took place in 2018, this time in Africa. So again, they completed some further genetic studies to try to understand where these pathogens were coming from. And again, found that in this case as well, in, in the case of Africa, the, the, the pathogen had come originally from South America. So they have continued this collaboration, again, trying to inform how to respond to the, to the fungus, also develop some information as to which fungicide may be useful to respond to this again, if there were to be other outbreaks in other settings. Um, again, as part of this follow-up in the collaboration, they decided to preprint their findings in June, 2022, and their journal publication actually was just came up uh, last week in PLOS Biology. But again, as you can see, the preprint was a great way to get these findings to the community almost a year prior to the journal publication. Another potential uh, benefit of preprints, as Kanika was explaining earlier, is this element of there are no barriers due to cost, but we want to maintain that diversity in participation, in participation and in disseminating different uh, types of results. We mentioned earlier the potential barriers associated with language. As I mentioned, researchers work in many countries, in many regions, and often also the, the local languages are particularly important to keep that uh, knowledge uh, going for those communities. English has become the dominant language in scientific publications, although I think it's interesting to remind ourselves that it was not always the case. This is an analysis of publications uh, based on the database Web of Science, and it looked at the uh, publication outputs from the 1900s all the way to 2015. 
And one of the things that it came out from this analysis, as you can see there, is that the percentage of papers uh, compared to the total output in publications, but the percentage of papers that are um, uh, coming out that are not published in English has actually dramatically dropped uh, over the last century. So you can see in the 1900s, it was around 35%. While when we look at the more recent times from the two, uh, year 2000 onwards, this has dropped dramatically to uh, under 5%. At the same time, we have to remind ourselves that there is, again, a lot of research in many disciplines and by many communities that is being done uh, and, and actually published also not in English. And it is important to give visibility and to give avenues for authors to disseminate this work also promptly, I mean, in journal, in journal settings, but also through other uh, means. Again, by comparison to the earlier uh, graph, I we wanted to show this other analysis completed on uh, outputs for journal articles, this specifically for, for Brazil. It was completed by, by a researcher who's originally from there and, and looked at the a uh, number of publications, again, coming out in English and also in, the, in, in Portuguese, the language from, from Brazil. And as you can see in those index in, in Web of Science and in certain discipline, the overarching majority of what's coming out in English, uh, sorry, the overarching majority of publications are in English. But when we compare this with uh, outputs that are not indexed in Web of Science, that have certain criteria as to which journals will include in the database, there are certain disciplines, and again, particularly humanities, social sciences, and linguistics, where we see a lot of publications coming out in Portuguese, uh, again, not indexed in the web of science. So we need to remind ourselves that there is all of this knowledge, all of this research activity uh, that also takes place not in English, and it's important to provide avenues, again, for, for those researchers to disseminate that. And we thought that we would show this example, again, that, where preprints have provided a tool towards this. This is a preprint that was uh, published in the preprint server Silo Preprints last year. Silo uh, Preprints is hosted by the Silo Network, which is a, a digital library, has been in operation in South America for 25 years and has done a lot of work to, to support, uh, again, the visibility for research from the region. Um, in this particular case, uh, uh, Silo preprints actually, when it started, very actively decided that it wanted to include different languages. They accept papers in English, but also Spanish and Portuguese. But in this case, they received this submission from an author who's been um, doing some work around education and teaching of the Quechua language, which is one of the original languages from Ecuador. And he's keen on, on supporting the development of skills and abilities and, again, the, the knowledge of the language. And this author decided to uh, share the, what he has been doing in terms of uh, the teaching of the language and write the paper itself in the Quechua language. Um, and Silo Preprints was very happy to be inclusive and actually also host the, the, the preprint in that language. So the, the author uh, essentially decided to use preprints in this way with the motivation to make those resources that he had used for his teaching available to others. And the preprint also came out with an open license enabling reuse. And he decided to also publish at a local journal. So the paper has come up as a journal publication, also in the Quechua language. But I, I thought that one of the interesting messages also from, from this uh, a story is that he published in a, a, a local, um, uh, a local uh, journal that, again, doesn't have a lot of visibility necessarily in terms of indexing, but by virtue of having that paper in the preprint server and the fact that there are a number of uh, literature indexers and search tools that are now including preprints as well. So still uh, preprints is incorporated and actually the preprint in certain databases is providing more visibility to this work than the journal uh, article version itself. And now I'll hand back over to Kanika, who's going to tell us about a fantastic project on, on negative results that she led. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, like now I want to move to, uh, to uh, another cases of the use of preprints. So first, I want to talk about uh, negative results. Uh, so, you know, like research has shown that, you know, like new and exciting findings will always be published more frequently uh, than if the results are negative or they're not clear. And most likely the journalists will not take it. And if these results are not published, 
then subsequently these uh, you know kind of research will also not be funded because it is always easier to find something where you find something which is more exciting and uh, supports the hypothesis more and you know this process uh, uh, is called you know the fact that more positive results are being published this is called publication bias and you know science is about acquiring knowledge so when scientific literature becomes distorted because you only publish one kind of results uh, this all uh, knowledge also becomes trustworthy because then you know know what are the other pieces of the puzzle and how they are fitting together uh, as you can see in this um, image here and uh, so in this particular case you know like uh, uh, the authors had tested what is the effect of uh, antidepressants uh, do they really have that efficacy as they're touted to be and uh, what they find was that you know there is some sort of a publication bias which has influenced the widespread use of antidepressants and they may actually have less efficacy in certain groups than originally thought and you know like these kind of studies are important especially like in medical literature because uh, prescription and the non prescription drugs they have a lot of big money and negative results do not actually help sell the drugs so um, uh, you know in this particular case study we know that there is some sort of an overestimation about the efficacy of antidepressants uh, to treat depression or anxiety disorders and they wanted to find out if that uh, is due to some sort of a publication bias so they compared what are, whatever the number of trials that were submitted to the food and drug administration by the pharmaceutical companies versus what were the resulting publications in the scientific journals and so fda had 57 trials registered uh, out of which 41 were positive and 16 were negative and uh, out of the 41 positive trials 40 were published in journal articles but then out of the 16 trials which did not have uh, you know positive results only 9 of them were published and then there was even a bias within those uh, nine particular publications because most of the time you know these not so great results would be hidden uh with uh, as like a supplemental figure or something in like a, a more positive you know based study so uh, you know and that would make the true result even uh, more unclear in that case so this overabundance of basically positive trials has created some sort of a skewed representation of the efficacy of these drugs uh, for the anxiety disorders and you know like this is only one case um and it is possible you know like that uh there are many medical drugs in the market which may have been facing these kind of publication bias because the trials which yielded negative results were not uh, accurately represented in the scientific literature so um can we move to the next slide yeah so uh, like in these graphs you can also see what is the total number of negative results which have been published in the literature for different sciences the physical the biological and the social uh, and as you can see that there is a general tendency uh, as you know the years go by that more and more positive results are being published and uh, i think we all can relate to the fact like if you have worked in a lab in uh, as a researcher like so many times you are trying other people's research and you are not able to reproduce it uh, you know there might be some missing reagent or some missing condition and uh, you know there is always the fact that there is one hypothesis but you're not able to prove it so you think that you may be wrong and then you don't go ahead and uh, follow it further but then it is very important to publish those results as well because they can save the time and resources which might be which are invaluable resources in the scientific community and help advance science better so keeping this logic in mind uh, uh, you know uh, can we move to the next slide uh preprints we you know uh, so we were a group of asia bio fellows and we thought preprints can be a great tool uh, to share negative results and some of the reasons why we think that preprints uh, are great to share negative results is because first of all they're still results so positive negative it doesn't really matter as long as things are advancing science they are still results and they need to see the light of the day and uh, you know uh, to really advance science uh, in a better manner and the other thing is low cost uh, so and barriers because many journals traditional academic journals still want to publish uh, more positively skewed research uh, and you know uh, a researcher may have uh, trouble finding a place for their negative results there are some journals but not everyone is doing so and preprints offer a great way to really post your negative uh, results without uh, much gatekeeping and it also provides you you know increased flexibility as to how you want to share the 
results. So it doesn't have to be just like one supplemental file of negative data, which gets lost in the whole uh, myriad of the entire paper and really doesn't get that much attention. But, uh, you know, with proper controls, it can be one figure paper or two figure paper. And uh, this really allows uh, those results to gain visibility. Uh, so keeping in mind, we organized uh, in the next slide a competition so that people can share their negative results and become a preference winner. Uh, and, you know, if it, it was a great success, we had uh, a lot of entries in different fields of biology and the experimental sciences, basically, and we selected three winners uh, in different fields. So one uh, in neuroscience, one in uh, microbiology and immunology, and the other in cell biology. So uh, uh, on the AZBio website, uh, there are fantastic blog posts, uh, you know, about all of the three papers now, uh, like why they shared their negative results finding, uh, and why is it important for the scientific community as well? Uh, but maybe I'll highlight one particular case here in the next slide, which is uh, a research on antimicrobial uh, peptides by Mark Hansen. And uh, you know, this research was initially a part of a larger study because they wanted to characterize uh, how these genes, which are called antimicrobial peptides, work. Uh, and antimicrobial peptides, these are immune effectors. So these are um, antimicrobials which are encoded by the host immune system and they defend uh, a person against infection. And there's been a long-standing debate in the field about uh, these antimicrobial peptides, which are produced as a part of the immune response. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, data or the literature which suggests that maybe these uh, antimicrobial peptides are contributing to aging and other inflammatory syndromes. So the, uh, you know, the model surrounding the particular study was that uh, or the hypothesis of the authors was that AMPs or these antimicrobial peptides are damaging the host. Um, uh, and so they went out and they tested uh, this hypothesis in flies, but they didn't find any evidence that if you do not have these antimicrobial peptides, the flies are going to live any better than the normal flies. Uh, and so they had carefully controlled experiments, uh, you know, with different conditions and different um, uh, uh, mutant flies and by deleting a range of different antimicrobial peptides, but uh, they couldn't find like broadly that these uh, peptides are contributing to aging. There might be some test cases, you know, like maybe there were uh, a little bit of statistical significance in some particular kind of uh, uh, neurovascular uh, diseases or so on and so forth, but not in general. And, uh, you know, so you can read from the author's response here that they spent five years to test this current model, but they didn't find any uh, evidence of that. And, uh, you know, so by publishing the results, hopefully they hope that somebody else can avoid the same workload that they had to go through uh, in coming to this particular conclusion. And in addition to preprinting, they also took advantage of the review comments, which is a free review service uh, that is offered, uh, you know, and um, it is published in a journal now. So it has seen the light of the day. It has under it didn't have to undergo the drastic gatekeeping by reviewers, but a more constructive community dialogue by review comments. So uh, I think uh, it is important uh, that more and more people are able to share their negative results, and the journals are also supportive uh, of these findings, uh, you know, uh, which are preprinted. Uh, next slide. Uh, so and going in line with this, I want to highlight another use case of uh, tools and resources, something which has benefited me actually personally uh, in my research as well. Uh, so next slide, please. So why sharing tools and resources is important? Uh, I think we know that, uh, you know, in this graph that you can see that uh, different parts of the world spend drastically different amounts of their uh, expenditure or their budgets on research and development in science. So we know that, like, so as you can see here in North America and Europe, about you know, almost one fifth to one fourth of the budget is spent on science. But if you look at South America or Africa or Asia, it's only one percent, two percent of the entire budget which is being spent on science. So uh, we, they don't have that much uh, access to resources and tools. Um, the next slide. And similarly, you can see in this graph. So this graph shows you how many number of researchers per country versus the amount of budget which is being spent. So this graph is again skewed with the United States, again, and uh, you know, uh, other countries which have more uh, population engaged in research. And as a result, they have more R&D uh, expenditures uh, in uh, science as well. But again, this is not the case in the majority of the world, where maybe only a fraction of people 
uh, are you know contributing to science because it's they're still in the developing world and the budgets are not as high in getting access to knowledge so some of the tools and tricks which you know like can be shared so to make something cheaper alternative for an already established scientific things these tools are generally not published in tradition journals but there may be some knowledge which just remains in the lab so uh, i'm going to highlight this particular paper in the next slide so i do cloning on a very regular basis in my lab and if you were to order this particular reagent for cloning uh, you know you are spending about 20 dollars per reaction or so um, but uh, in this particular paper uh, authors brian reeve and constance jeffco they you know basically told how to make you know instead of buying from a company you can make your own uh, cloning master mix uh, and it came out to be much cheaper so almost 100 times cheaper and with tenfold greater efficiency and i have been using this method since forever and you know like this particular preprint has not been published in any journal but as you can see from the metrics uh, it is you know like people tweet about it uh, people download and use it which uh, actually is you know but maybe it's not getting as much citations as it would uh, want to be get which uh, we'll come to a little bit later that why uh, you know, if somebody has shared these tools and resources, why is it important to cite uh, these particular instances as well? So, um, you know, like preprints can be a great resource again because they don't have any barriers associated with gatekeeping to share these uh, tools and resources, which may not find like a traditional home in uh, an academic journal. And uh, you know, these are important, uh, but for the scientific community, so maybe even add small changes or something which. Uh, you know, a protocol which has been optimized for one organism or one particular scientific method. So it, uh, if it's, you know, a little bit of tweaking and everything to make it economically more effective for something else. So these kind of resources, if they're shared with the wider scientific community via preprints, they can really help advance science in countries where uh, the budgets may not be as high uh, as uh, the, you know, the rest of the world. So next slide. So, so we discussed these four very different preprints, uh, uh, you know, use cases of preprints uh, in many different scenarios. But uh, I think uh, what is important takeaway is that these particular test cases, maybe we can just count on our fingertips. They are not as widespread uh, as they should be. And, uh, you know, we are not leveraging the full potential of preprints. So in the next slide, uh, you know, you can see here that uh, what is the gap between when a preprint comes out and when a paper publication comes out? So uh, in this case, you know, like most of the preprints usually appear four to six months before journal publication. So, you know, most of the times we would only submit a preprint when we are submitting it to a publication or, you know, in worst cases, it is also the case that, you know, a preprint is just about to come out in a publication and somebody just released the preprints version a week or two before, which is not the ideal case for preprints. And we really want the preprints uh, as a tool in which uh, the scientific community can be more engaged in dialogue with each other. Uh, and really accelerate the pace of science. So um, over to Irati, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, what is, you know, like the current uh, landscape and the drawbacks uh, and how can we get there. Thank you so much, Kanik, and I, I totally agree with what you're saying about the, the, the fact that there are many other ways in which preprints can actually accelerate the communication of research. <clears throat> and I, I find it very interesting, again, that time frame that we see in terms of the four, six months that totally matches the, the peer review process. But as we were discussing since the beginning of the talk, the, the preprints removed this, a lot of the barriers about gatekeeping, essentially, as, an, as a researcher, you can choose when you're ready to communicate your, your science with, with the community by using preprints. There is, again, the barrier to getting that publicly available is much lower which again means that you can choose to publish when you are ready to publish and it doesn't need to look like a journal submission. And, and an example of this is this uh, fantastic preprint uh, by Ian Chismant and, and Alexander Navarro, who was a student in his lab at the time, where they were working in a cell biology uh, project and they had some unexpected results from some experiments. And they were a little bit thinking, what, where do we go from here? It's not what we expected to get from this project and decided to actually just write up the results they had then and put them out as a preprint with a very short preprint, only a couple of figures. And they very proactively then went to the community to say, this is what we have. 
give us your thoughts, give us feedback on this. What should we do next? And they had a fantastic response from the community. A lot of researchers contacted them through social media or even privately to offer suggestions and ideas. And what the authors did was take that on board, complete further experiments based on the, on the feedback and posted a new version of the preprint five months later, again, for many of you may know, but it's very easy. On a preprint server, you can take the, the copy of your paper, up, up, uh, up, um, update it, make changes, and post another version on the same uh, server, again, all the, with all the versions uh, linked. So that's what they did here. They leveraged this versioning option of preprints, posted the revised version of, of the uh, preprint. Again, asked for feedback from the community. They got further comments and decided to then develop the project further and came back with another iteration of the paper they posted a few months down the line. Then it started to look a little bit more like what you expect in a, in a journal article with multiple figures, many more uh, results, much more data, et cetera. And then eventually decided to uh, also take the step of submitting the manuscript to a journal and disappear uh, at the Molecular Biology of the Cell in September, 2022. But again, the key message here is that the authors decided to take it into their own hands to make the decision as to when this was ready to be shared with the community. And by using and leveraging preprints, they actually served their work with the community almost two years before uh, uh, the journal publication. So we've, we've really expanded that time frame from the four to six months to almost a, a, a two year period. Um, there are many other ways, again, where I think we are, uh, there is much more potential to leverage preprints compared to the current practice. Kanika was giving these fantastic examples of the uh, preprints reporting negative results, but interestingly, uh, we don't see as many negative and confirmatory or contradictory results being posted uh, as preprints, and, and I think there is a still potentially some, again, a stigma or, you know, some cultural issues around uh, sharing negative results. But, Interestingly, as I mentioned, not enough uh, of this being shared. Uh, what we saw here is an analysis of content in BioArchive. Uh, as a, when you submit to BioArchive as an author, it provides you the, the option of indicating whether you are reporting new results or rather in the categories confirmatory or contradictory. Again, if you are following on previous published work and, and report something that doesn't go in the same direction. Um, and, and Jackie Carrozza, who was another of the ASA Bio Fellows, decided to look at this distribution. As you can see here, what she saw is that it's only a minority of the papers that appear on BioArchive that are posted under the confirmatory and contradictory categories. And actually, that proportion of papers in those categories appears to be decreasing over time. Um, so again, there may be some cultural issues here around uh, certain negative results, but I think we can encourage researchers to leverage preprints. Again, it doesn't need to look like a journal article. It can be here a couple of results. I was trying this, didn't work. And maybe I will save time for somebody else who may come to this protocol to this idea later as uh, Kanika was explaining. A further uh, element that we wanted to highlight is the fact that we have tried to provide uh, ideas and suggestions as to how different communities from different settings working in different languages uh, can use preprints for their own research and for their own outputs. Uh, but we know that there are still disparities in terms of how preprints are being used uh, across the world. Some, some analysis of, again, content in certain uh, preprint servers so that it is much more common in certain countries, usually in North America and Western Europe, to preprint papers compared to some others. Again, this probably relates to the culture around publication practices and also the, the research settings and the assessment framework for researchers, depending on whether preprints are recognized as outputs again for, for their assessment. Um, but one interesting thing. Uh, that we wanted to share was this analysis that came out recently in PLOS One. Um, the authors are reporting a tool that uh, can match preprints to the uh, journal version, so the journal version of record for that article, and, and they, they leverage this tool to, to look at a number of, of elements. Again, we saw the, the time frame to, to appear at the journal earlier. But the other thing that they compare is was the percentage of the papers that they can actually match to a journal publication, again, according to the distribution uh, per country. And as you can see from their analysis, uh, that percentage varies quite a bit, again, uh, based on the, uh, uh, geography, on the geography and the region where the authors are based. 
we see again North America and, and, and Europe uh, uh, represented much more in terms of the authors getting that preprint all the all the steps all over into the journal publication and much less so in some other settings again there may be some language barrier some other barriers to getting those papers into the journals but it does show that there is a lot of research that is being served in preprint format that it is being made available in that manner so this opportunity for those communities again independent of whether then that that makes it to the journal version of record those communities are having that opportunity to share their work uh, through uh, through the preprint format again in in the uh, in the format uh, that they consider suitable and also without any financial barriers. And and before we finish, we also wanted to encourage all of you to take part in preprinting. So we want to finish with a few uh, suggestions for you. But Kanika will will start with this. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, like all of these are very interesting, uh, uh, you know, like why we are not there uh, yet. But like, as an early career researcher, I would highlight like some of the perspectives that we can do to, uh, you know, encourage the use of preprints more. So, you know, like there was a time um, in the 18th, 19th century when people, if, you know, somebody wanted to share their findings, they would just create their own journal, so, like Rudolf Virchow, who's like, you know, the founder of cell biology, he just created his own virtual journal because he wanted to share uh, whatever he is finding. Uh, and, you know, like, we, I think all of us probably cannot start our own journal, but, you know, we can kind of reclaim the agency as authors that we have in sharing our results. So, uh, you know, like, share the work when it's ready. It can also be like a poster which you have presented at a conference, uh, which can be converted into a preprint format. And um, now BioArchive also allows you to link your conference talk to the particular data. So, you know, we can take advantage of that as well. And then, uh, you know, your negative results or any, you know, kind of tricks and techniques which uh, you kind of see the light of the day, uh, you know, you share that. And then, uh, you know, if you want to utilize the regional preprint servers to, uh, to disseminate findings which might be more relevant to the local community. So, you know, going this whole theme of global and local, knowledge can be shared at all the levels. Uh, you know, we should take, we should be taking more advantage of it, uh, you know, but it all comes down to also giving credit to the authors because as early career researchers, we might not be motivated uh, to share all of these uh, things as preprints uh, if we're not given, uh, if we're not given enough credit, like, you know, citing of the preprints, uh, encouraging others to cite uh, these preprints of, you know, like maybe uncommon negative results or some tools and methods and protocols which are very prone to being neglected. Uh, in citations. Uh, and uh, so these are some of the things which, uh, as authors and as researchers, uh, we should be uh, advocating for more. And uh, Irati would probably share a little bit more about like the uh, the broader scientific infrastructure. Yes, thank, thanks so much. And again, I think it's, again, I, researchers are really at the heart of this and, and, and the support for preprints. And obviously, they, they produce and post uh, preference, but I think it's important to remind everyone in the scholarly communications that we can all play a part in this, in 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 supporting those researchers who want to utilize preprints, but also supporting the preprinting uh, ecosystem as a whole. Uh, so there are a number of other things that other stakeholders can also do. It's important to remind ourselves that preprints are again are based on valuable infrastructure, and we can all do our bit to support uh, the preprint servers and associated. Uh, overlay services and, and projects and initiatives that are being developed around that. If you are an active researcher, you can get involved with moderation and you know supporting the activities of preprint server, servers themselves, checking the papers before uh, they get published. But there are also ways in which we can uh, again increase and leverage their value. I think there can be more than to to uh, facilitate workflows for linking. Uh, of preprints to other outputs, again, surfacing them, in, encouraging further integration with uh, indexing services and literature search. So, so that again, we surface that work. And as Kanika was saying, we, we give these authors the visibility and credit they deserve. Preprints can also be another fantastic opportunity if you're a journal to experiment with peer review. There are a number of activities being developed, again, doing peer review on preprints and services with uh, that are happy to explore uh, integration and partnerships with journals. So I encourage you to also look into that. If you're a journal, essentially, how can you integrate 
preprints into your processes. And of course, we can all be activists and advocate for preprints, uh, not only by posting preprints ourselves, of course, but also encouraging others in our community uh, to post preprints. I, I would say, at least in, in the life sciences, the, the, these one-on-one -on -one conversations between researchers or you know, journal editors and researchers have been hugely influential in, in making sure that researchers felt more comfortable adopting preprints for, for their research. And obviously, we can also all collectively um, encourage recognition of preprints as valid outputs as part of the, again, evaluation processes through funders and institutions. And again, the, the, that work gets uh, recognized. And with that, we wanted to uh, finish there. We've provided some of the information and, and resources that ASA Bio uh, provides about preprints on, on our website. I encourage you to, to have a look. We have a number of resources also translated to different languages. Um, you have our contact details there, and I think we have a, a few minutes before the next session. We would be happy to address any questions if there are any. Um, and I guess the best way, if you have any questions, is to post them on the chat. Thank you. Right, and this is the interesting moment where we are all very polite and you know muted on Zoom. But <laughs> Kanika and I are kind of you know, wondering. I, yes, Kanika. I think there's a question on chat by Kate. Uh, maybe ahead. you know you can take it. Uh, uh, so the question is like uh, you know do do you have any recommendations about searching or maybe if Kate wants to speak her question, you know that can be done as well. How about it? Yeah. Thanks. Um, sure. Go ahead. This was a uh, really fascinating uh, talk. I, I always love the um, the visuals that your organization has. Um, I'm interested in recommendations about searching for um, literature that's disseminated on different preprint servers, and especially in the context of evidence synthesis, like systematic reviews. We want to be able to do really comprehensive searches, making sure to include literature that's being produced in, you know, by scholars who are based at um, LMICs, maybe disseminating their work by, by preprints. But we also want to have a really transparent and reproducible search. So any, any advice either for people searching or for preprint servers that want to enhance the discoverability of the uh, preprints that that authors deposit with them. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you so much, um, Kate, for the question. It's, it's interesting because it's, it's a question I've, I've had before, and um, when I was working as an editor, I, I I saw many systematic reviews, so I understand the importance of you know how do you search and you know making so that you don't double count particular papers and and preprints come into that. Um, I would say a couple of things that come to mind in this context. So in the uh, in the sense of uh, searching the literature, I think one of the things that I would highlight is being aware of the fact that the different uh, tools for searching the literature have different coverage for, for preprints. So some of them are essentially integrate more or index and include more preprints than others, although they, they tend to have for all the right reasons, their own criteria as to which servers they will include, et cetera. Um, one platform that I know is uh, quite good in terms of coverage and again, very transparent as to which servers they include um, is Europe PMC. They index both uh, journal publications, but also preprints, and they are quite broad in terms of the number of uh, preprint servers they include. They, they have a focus on biomedical sciences, but again, for systematic reviews, often they, they have a focus more on the clinical side, so, so that, that would be a, a good place. Um, the other databases that may be useful is, I know Dimensions, um, again, has quite broad coverage and includes uh, preprints as well. And I believe that Web of Science as well now has started including preprints. So I guess it's important to, to bear in mind again what's the, what's the coverage in the servers and knowing that you know, every indexing service has its boundaries for all the right reasons. Um, the one thing to consider in terms of uh, systematic reviews, of course, is that if you're doing a search that includes both preprints and, and journal publications, you, you should not count the same article twice. It's the same work. So you just need to be aware of that, which ties to your second question about advice for preprint servers. I think one of the things that I would recommend to the servers is to try to really 
work to, to surface that linking between the preprint and then the journal publication once there is a journal article. If there is one, again, you, you can post a preprint and it doesn't need to go all the way to become a journal publication. Um, but if, uh, if, if there is a journal uh, version of record, having that link when you land on the preprint and vice versa, I would advise the same for, to the journals, again, for that transparency in, in terms of the history of that paper. Um, that can be uh, quite useful. And I know that some service, for example, BioArchive and MedArchive try to surface those links. Um, but I would encourage service to try to, again, facilitate that. And I, I understand, I mean, where you can automate this, again, there may be not a um, perfect tool, although we saw the, the preprint match tool. So hopefully that's something that may be helpful for, for different platforms. Um, but again, th that linking, I think, can, can make that much more transparent for everybody in terms of saying here is the different versions of the same project. So for the purpose of evidence building, you should count it once in the systematic review. And I thank everyone who's sharing uh, tips and resources on this. I know I have some experts in the audience. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Right, I think we have a couple more minutes before the next session. So if there are any other questions, um, uh, feel free to uh, let us know. Uh, and thank you, Nina, for sharing about uh, science of them. Um, I think that we are going to see, uh, it's fantastic to see all the development that we've seen around the, the linking between outputs. So that I, I think that will really help with clarifying in terms of the, uh, of the preprint space as well. Right, the other thing I would say, if there are no other questions, obviously we didn't mention this, we wanted to give you the examples, but it's a bio, uh, has a community for anybody who has interest in preprints and wants to learn more or perhaps be engaged in different ways. Uh, we are very happy to have anyone join our community. Again, we have information on the website and I'm happy to share with anybody interested. Um, you, it's a way of keeping up to date. And again, we, we, you know, we often share resources with community members and you can participate or be engaged in projects to the level of your interest and, uh, and availability. Right, if there are no other questions, I think what I'm going to share is probably everybody is an expert in sh shed now, if I didn't mispronounce, but that's where you have information about the program. There should be uh, the next session starting in a couple of minutes, and I'm going to share the Zoom link for that session. In case you need it, just make sure to transition into that Zoom link. And before we close here, I wanted to thank Kanika again for, the, for doing this with me and uh, it's been super fun yeah, to prepare thank this you. talk thank you yeah right thank you everybody and i'm sure i'll see you around in either another session tonight or in the coming uh two days thank you everyone